country was called Israel and the other country was called Palestine. And in 1948, the first Prime Minister of Israel, uh, David Ben-Gurion, David Ben-Gurion declared the establishment of a new state of Israel. And the establishment of that state of Israel, my dear students, has contributed to the beginning of conflict between the Arabs and Jews. In fact, it started with a war uh, in 1948. As a result of that creation of state of Israel, my dear students, there was a series of war which was fought by this, uh, you know, by the Arabs and Jews, and that was started in 1948, as I've said, and this war, the, uh, and this war, my dear students, was fought between Israel and five Arab nations, five Arab nations. Here, my dear students, we are talking of countries like Egypt. Uh, you know, there was Egypt. There was Lebanon, there was Syria, there was Jordan, and there was Iraq. So five countries joined together to fight against, uh, you know, to fight against Israel. And that was 1948. My dear students, another war followed in 1956. In 1956. And my dear students, uh, this war was called... This war of 1956 was called a Suez Canal War. Suez Canal War. Why Suez Canal War? It was called Suez Canal uh, because one of the reasons for the outbreak of this war, it is about the control of Suez Canal, where the British and the French wanted to continue to control the Suez Canal. In fact, they wanted conflict between Israel and Egypt not to come near the Suez Canal. And uh, they wanted all forces to withdraw from the Suez, the Suez Canal. So Israel withdrew, but Egypt rejected. Because Suez Canal, they said, it belongs to their, uh, it belongs to their country. So as a result of... Uh, you know, as a result of that, the French and the, uh, the British, they joined forces to come to attack Egypt. And this war therefore includes three countries. Egypt in one hand, Israel, Britain, and France on the other hand. And that is 1956. My dear students, in 1967, yet there was another war which was fought between Israel and Egypt. And this war was called the uh, Six Days War. It is called the Six Days War because this war was fought for six days. It was for, for, for six days between Israel and Egypt. In fact, Egypt was leading other Arab countries to fight that war. And that war, of course, ended with the victory to Israel. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the, the Arab nations lost, uh, I mean, they lost the part of their lands. We shall come to see it in detail. Uh, in 1970, uh, you know, in 1973, my dear students, there was another war, and this war was called uh, 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 this war was called the Yom Kippur. It was called the Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur War. This war was fought in 1923, and my dear students, this was called the Yom Kippur because the war started during the uh, you know during the whole Jewish festival of Yom Kippur, and the timing was correct because at that time most of the Jewish soldiers, uh, you know, mo mo uh, most of the Jewish soldiers were on holiday. So the Egypt attacked Israel uh, because they knew that they knew that most of the Jewish soldiers were on holiday. So, my dear students, this is the way we can describe about wars which was fought. So, our part, uh, you know, our part of our lesson of today, my dear students. It is about the causes and outcome of the Jewish Arab Wars of 1948, 1956, and 1967, and 1923, and their impact. So this is what we are going to look at uh, now. So let's look at the causes of 1948 Arab-Jewish War. First, of course, we said the war started, you know, war started in 1948, soon after the declaration of a new state of Israel, on May 14th, 1948. Remember I said declaration was made by David Ben-Gurion. And the moment Israel declared their nations, uh, then the Arabs started to organize for war, uh, trying to oppose the declaration of that new state of Israel. Let's look at the causes for the 1948 Arab-Jewish war. The creation of state of Israel without, without the consent of the Arabs. Consent of the Arabs. That means the state of Israel was established by United Nations without, cons uh, without consulting the Arab nations. That means the Palestinian people were not consulted about the establishment of state of Israel. Remember, what has to be divided there, it was Palestine to form two nations, Israel and 
Palestine on the other hand, but the, you know, uh, but the Palestinian people are not consulted. There was no referendum in that country which would ask people, whether the Jews or the Arabs who live in Palestine, to make a decision. Decision was made by United Nations. And to prove this, my dear students, even the Arab delegations, even the Arab members of the United Nations, they walked out during the voting uh, during the voting for establishment of a state of Israel in the United Nations in, uh, you know, a, I mean, early in 1947. So this is the first reason which led to the, uh, you know, uh, which causes the Arab-Jewish War of 1948. Another thing which caused the Arab-Jewish War of 1948, uh, my students, is the withdrawing of the British forces from Palestine. Withdrawing of the British forces. from Palestine. That means the British forces withdrew from Palestine without a proper power handover arrangement. There was no proper power handover arrangement. That means they just moved out of Palestine without a proper handover. So for that case, after they left Palestine, then uh, if, uh, you know, the Israelis just came and filled the vacuum. Remember, even before the establishment of that state of Israel, already the Jews had already started the plan of taking over Palestine. They had already started the plan of taking over Palestine by establishing some terrorist groups, which of course we have said about in the previous lesson. Uh, Irgun, there was Haganah, and so on and so forth. And we even mentioned people like Moshe Dayan, who took a leading role in, the, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, in that terrorist group called the Haganah and so on. So the British just left Palestine without a proper power handover, and that left a vacuum, vacuum which was then filled by the Jewish. At that time, the Jews were very strong compared to the Arabs. So that is the, uh, you know, that is the second. The third, my dear students, is that large number of Jewish immigr immigrants between 1940 to 1947. 1940 to 1947. My dear students, here we are talking about Zionism. Zionism, remember, is the, you know, uh, I mean, Zionism is the movement which intends to bring all people who are Jewish in origin to come back to Israel, re regardless wherever they live. If they are living in Europe, if they are living in America, their ancestors come from that part of Palestine, then they have the right to come back to Palestine and establish their home there. So large number of Jewish immigrants between 1940 to 1947 uh, is one of the reasons which led to the Arab Jewish war because the more those people come the more those people were taking over land which was previously occupied by the Arabs so that contributed to uh, to uh, to Arab Jewish war of 1948 my dear students after looking at those causes of 1948 Arab Jewish war let's now go to impact what are the impact of 1948 Arab Jewish war the first impact is that Israel occupied more land than the UN plan had offered Israel took more land than what the UN has offered remember Israel was given 56 percent of the Palestine land of the Palestine land and the Arabs, of course, were given 43% of the Palestine land. But at the end of that 1948 war, most of the land, in fact, the, uh, you know, I mean, in fact, the size of Jewish land was increased more than what they were given by the United Nations. And as you can see here, my dear students, uh, you know, this is 1946, as you can see here. And what is painted green, what is painted green, this is the Arab land. This is the Palestinian land, land which, is, uh, which was occupied by the Arabs. And what you see, the white color here, represents the Jewish land. So in 1946, before the UN partition, the Jews were living in a very small portion of land. It was just like the dots, as you can see. And this is 1947. After the UN partition, uh, you know, I mean, this is the UN partition plan of 1947. And as you can see here, my dear students, uh, the, the Jews were given 56% of the land. And the Arabs were given 43% of the land, as you can see. You see? So land here is decreasing. The Arabs had much more larger land here. But in 1947, at the UN partition plan, the land was decreased. If you go to 1949, 
to 1967. Remember, 1949 here was after the 1948 Arab Jewish War, and 1950, uh, 1967 it was just before the uh, Six Days War. So you can see, this is now the land of Arabs. The land has been even more reduced, have been even more reduced. And this is Gaza, as you can see. So, my dear students, this is Israel. So that means the size of, territorial size of Israel has been increased even more. And in 2000, of course in 2000, this is the way it is. Now the Arabs are living in the dogs, as you can see. You know, this is West Bank and this is Gaza. And in most of the land has now been taken by Israel. So, they, you know, I, I, I mean, so as you can see here, uh, you know, there was the changing borders, the changing borders. So this has to become, uh, you know, one of the impact. The second impact, my dear students, is that a hundred of Palestinian people became refugees in the, neighboring, in the neighboring countries. And after the war, Israel refused those people to return to Palestine. So the millions of, the millions of Palestinians, they became refugees to the neighboring countries. Some of them went to, uh, they, uh, you know, some of them went to live in, uh, you know, they went to live in Lebanon. Others went in Jordan. Others, in fact, they went to Syria. Some others went to North Africa, in Egypt, and so on. And even after the war, uh, Israel refused those people, to return, those people to return to their homeland. So that is another very important uh, impact. Another impact of 1948 Arab Jewish war, my dear students, is that the relation between USA and Israel was strengthened. The relation between USA and Israel was strengthened. The relation between USA and Israel was strengthened. Uh, remember, because of that 1948 war and because of the fact that many Arab nations joined together trying to destroy Israel, the United States of America felt that they have the responsibility of defending Israel by using whatever means possible. So since then, United States of America has been providing weapons and the other financial and technical aid to Israel until now as we speak. So the relations between United States of America and Israel was strengthened because of the, uh, you know, because of the 1948 Arab Jewish war, due to a fact that the Americans then they realized that if they don't help Israel, then Israel one day is going to be destroyed. Because so many Arab nations joined together and Israel uh, felt that they were the lonely country in the region, a country which is surrounded by the, uh, you know, by the Arab nations, the one they referred as the enemy. So, my dear students, as you can see, uh, this is also another very important impact of the 1948 Arab Jewish War. But, my dear students, let's now come to a very important part of this uh, lesson of today. Let's ask ourselves a question. Why Arabs were defeated in 1948? in that Arab Jewish war. Why were they defeated? The Arabs were defeated for, of course, for many reasons, but one reason which is so important, the first reason which is so important here, my dear students, is that the Arab troops were poorly equipped compared to Israel. The Arab forces were very poorly equipped compared to Israel. They didn't have sophisticated weapons. The weapons they were using were very poor, that's one. Uh, they were using weapons were very poor, but also, they didn't have the, you know, the army, the, the Arab army. The Arab army was very poorly trained. And so you could not compare the Arab army and the Israeli army. Israeli army, we said it earlier, they were very experienced because they fought Second World War. And most of them, remember, they have just come back from Europe where they had a lot of experience. But when you speak of weapons, Israel was receiving weapons from USA. But also, during that 1948 Arab, uh, you know, Jewish Arab War, they received a lot of weapons from Czechoslovakia. A lot of weapons from Czechoslovakia. And so you can, uh, you know, and so as you can see, this then explain why the Arabs were defeated during the 1948 Arab Jewish War. Another point, my dear students, is that Israel fought desperately to win the war. They fought desperately to win the war regarding to what happened during the Second World War. You remember, my dear students, in our previous lesson, we spoke about the annihilation of Jews, the so-called Holocaust, where the millions of Jews were killed in the guest chamber. So the killing of Jews in the guest chamber, 
it became it became a lesson to the Jews. So during that Arab Jewish War of 1948, they considered that war as a matter of do or die. Do or die in the sense that if they, I mean, if they lose the war, they are going to die. And if they win, they are going to live. Because they have the experience of what happened in the concentration camp. And no one among the Jews wanted what happened during uh, that time to happen again. So for that case, my dear students, that's why Jews had fought desperately because they have to win the war. Another point, my dear students, is that the Arabs were divided. Arabs were divided. King Abdul of Jordan, for instance, wanted to occupy West Bank. While other Arab nations were going to war, King Abdul of Jordan, in fact, withdrew from the war. And in fact, he made, uh, uh, he made an agreement with Israel that uh, he's going to take West Bank. So you can see some of the Arab leaders were ambitious of taking Palestinian land. And this is exactly what happened, that after 1948, Arab Jewish war, uh, King Abdul of Jordan then was given uh, West Bank. And this also contributed to the defeat of the Arab nations because those Arab nations were divided. Another point is the role of Israeli terrorist group, Hanaga and Irgun. Hanaga and Irgun. My dear students, we said there is this group called Hanaga. This group, we said, has started to operate since 1930s. And there is Irgun, which is started early, much more early in 1920s. And these two groups, they were attacking some Palestinian targets. In fact, uh, you know, in fact, one time they attacked the, the Palestinian village, uh, you know, uh, at a time when the war was going on. So for that case, many Palestinian people, therefore, they moved out of their land because of the terror which has been presented by these two groups, Hanaga and Irgun. So this also became one of the reasons why the Arabs were defeated uh, in that war. My dear students, also, Israel support uh, from the United States of America. Israel's support from United States of America. United States of America had been always providing unconditional support to Israel. They were supported unconditionally. And this, of course, is after, uh, started after the end of Second World War. One of the things that organizations do in America, it is lobbying. They lobby. They are, you know, I mean, they are conducting lobbying in the Congress and in the executive branch. So United States, therefore, always is providing support to Israel uh, by using, uh, you know, by, uh, by giving them weapons, giving them money, and so on and so forth. Another reason for the defeat of the Arabs during that Arab Jewish show 1948 is the experience of Israelis from the Second World War. I said it earlier, that a lot of Israelis fought the Second World War. A lot of Jews fought the Second World War. Some of them fought particularly with the Allies. They fought with the British. They fought with the French against the Nazis, against Mussolini and so on. So at the end of the war, most of them had already acquired very, very large experience of, uh, you know, experience of war. So it was not, uh, you know, so, uh, so it was very simple for them to fight against the Arabs who were very highly inexperienced. So this also explains why those were defeated. Let's now look at the causes and the impact of 1956 Suez Canal War. The Suez Canal War, as we have said, this war was fought between, uh, you know, Israel on one hand, uh, you know, uh, sorry, Egypt on one hand, Israel, uh, France and Britain on the other hand. And the British and the French quarreled with the Egyptian president, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, because, uh, you know, over the control of Suez Canal. Uh, you know, this is the development of the Suez Canal. Suez Canal, of course, in 1875. You remember the time when that Suez Canal was built. Uh, um, Egypt, uh, France, and Britain, uh, they had shared in the construction of that Suez Canal. And the British government had been a, uh, had been a principal stockholder since 1875. But, in, uh, but on 26th of July 1956, Nasser announced that he was taking over the canal to get money to pay the Answan Dam construction. Remember, he asked for money from the Americans and they refused. So he said he wants to generate money that will help Egypt to construct the Answan, uh, you know, the Answan Dam construct, uh, the Answan Dam, uh, Answan Dam, which was so needed for irrigation and generation of hydroelectric power. On November 19, uh, of November 29th, Sorry, on October 29, 1956, Israel troops invaded Egypt. And just next day, France and Britain claim that they are worried about the damage of the Suez Canal. So ordered 
uh, so ordered soldiers to be far from the Suez Canal. As it was planned, Israel removed their forces, but Egypt rejected. And the, you know, as it was planned, uh, you know, so Israel complied, but Egypt rejected. So uh, the French and the British, therefore, they started their attack toward the. Uh, you know, toward the Egyptians and so on. So this is exactly what happened. Let's now look at the causes and the impact of 1956 Suez Canal War. The British and the French soldiers landed near the Egyptian city of Poseidon, and the Egyptians struck back by sinking the scores of ships. My dear students, you know, let's now look at the impact of Suez Canal War of 1956. What does this, you know, what impact does this Suez Canal War of 1956 has? Uh, the first impact is that Gamal Abdel Nasser assumed the leadership of Arab nationalism. Assumed the leadership of Arab nationalism. Uh, in fact, since that 1956 Arab-Jewish war, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser was considered as the leader of all Arab nations, all, all Arab nations, because of the way he stood firm to fight against Israel, to fight against Britain and France. In fact, uh, he, he won a lot of respect from, uh, you know, from the Arab nations. Uh, 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 you, uh, I mean, so this is the first very important impact. And remember, this was the time when the Arab nations were either fighting for independence or some others had already, or, you know, had just obtained their independence. So they needed somebody who can unite the Arab nations uh, very much more than ever. So Gamal Abdel Nasser therefore assumed the leader of Arab nationalism. Uh, the second, the second, my dear students, is that the Prime Minister of Britain, who was called Robert Anton Eden, Robert Anton Eden, in fact lost popularity and defeated in the election. He lost popularity and defeated in, 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 you know, in the election just a year, I mean, just a year later. That war was in 1956, and, uh, you know, and Anton Eden was defeated in the election in 1957 because of what happened. In fact, uh, the British people were not happy about the involvement of their country in that Suez Canal War, but they were even more unhappy uh, about the defeat of their country uh, in that war. Remember, that war was halted after the United States of America, uh, you know, uh, threatened to impose sanctions to France and Britain if they don't stop. And also after USSR had threatened to use nuclear, uh, to use nuclear weapons if that war does not stop. So you can see the war ended with, uh, I mean, and, uh, the war ended with a lot of shame to the Prime Minister of Britain, Robert, uh, Robert Anton Eden, and in fact with a lot of cheer to uh, the former President of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser. My dear students, uh, Robert Eden, who was the Prime Minister of Britain from 1955-56, that means he ruled the country for only two years, and he was then, uh, he was then forced to resign. Uh, Mr. Robert Anton Eden, this is what he said, uh, that the situation created by nationalization of the Suez Canal was the most hazardous that our country has never known since 1940 that it is something that his country has never experienced since 1940. He considered it as very hazardous. Remember, the Suez Canal was very important to uh, Britain because it was an investment, with an investment which was giving them uh, a lot of money. My dear students, another thing was the growing of Cold War after USSR threatened to use the nuclear weapon if the conflict continued. As we have said, uh, USSR threatened to use nuclear weapon if the conflict continued. And that, in fact, led to the growing of Cold War. Remember, it was for the first time that USSR and the USA, at least, they came into, uh, you know, they came into a tense. They came together to oppose that war between uh, Israel vis-a-vis uh, -vis Egypt, of course, together with the British and the French. My dear students, another impact of that 1956 Arab-Jewish war was the growing relation between Egypt and the USSR. The relations between Egypt and the USSR was very much improved. It was improved because of the way USSR had threatened to use nuclear weapons. Let's now look at another war, which is the Six Days War. Of course, as we have said, this war was started on June, uh, you know, June 5th, 1967, uh, the 5th of June.
1967. And of course, I said it earlier that this war was called the Six Days War because uh, it was fought for six days. It was fought for six days with a victory to Israel. In fact, uh, in a very short time of six days, Israel succeeded to, to wipe out the powerful Egyptian air forces. Egypt had a lot of warplanes which they just bought from uh, USSR, and all those planes were wiped away by the, uh, you know, by the Israelis air forces. And uh, Israel tank then smashed the Egyptian army into, you know, in Sinai and raced across the desert of, to the West Bank and so on. Because of this war, uh, the Arabs lost, uh, you know, lost, uh, you know, uh, lost some lands. For instance, Jordan, uh, Jordan uh, lost West Bank. Lebanon uh, lost the Car Valley. Syria lost Golan Heights. Egypt uh, lost uh, lost Sinai. Uh, you know, lost his Sinai, of course, and Gaza. So you can see, my dear students, uh, this is what happened. This is what happened during that 1967, uh, you know, Six Days War. Uh, Israel got a very large victory to that war. And, uh, you know, and this is the way that war has, uh, has ended. Uh, my dear students, another war which was also fought, it was, uh, it was called the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur War. Of course, we have said about this Yom Kippur War of 1973. This war, of course, was started by Egyptian forces. And Egypt and Syria army attacked Israel. And the date, as I said earlier, was very careful chosen because they chose the day which was the day of Jewish festival, the festival of Yom Kippur, where a lot of Jewish soldiers were on holiday. So they wanted to smash the Jewish uh, you know, army. And of course, some extent they succeeded. It is the Americans who rushed the warplane and other weapons to replace the ones which has been destroyed in the first fighting. So uh, Israel, after receiving weapons from Israeli states, they were able to recover and, in fact, to take back the areas which were formerly conquered by, you know, conquered by the Egyptian and Syrian forces. So because of this Yom Kippur war, then it was very clear. Uh, that the problem between the Arabs and Jews can no longer settle by war. After looking at the impact, the causes and impact of the Arab Jewish wars of 1948, 1956, 1967, and 1923, let us now go to another very important part of this lesson of today, and that is the Camp David Accord of September 1978. The Camp Davis Accord was signed in the United States in September 1978 and it was signed between the Prime Minister of Israel who was called Menachem Begin with the President of Egypt uh, who was, uh, you know, uh, who was Anwar al-Sadat and under the auspice of the American President Jimmy Carter and the, uh, you know, and the, treat was, the, the peace treaty was signed in uh, Camp David and that is why the accord was called the Camp David Accord. My dear students, as you can see, this is the picture which shows the United States President Jimmy Carter bringing together two leaders who were formerly enemies to each other. This is, uh, this is Anwar Sadat and this is Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel. This is the President of Egypt and this is the Prime Minister of, Is uh, of Israel just shaking hands with Jimmy Carter of the United States of America. My dear student, my dear students, let's now look at the agreement of, on Camp David Accord. What have they agreed? Israel agreed to return Egyptian occupied territories. Remember we said they have conquered some of the Egyptian territories. And here we are talking about the Sinai areas and uh, the Sinai areas which was conquered earlier in 1967 war uh, by Israel. So, it, uh, so Israel agreed to return that area back to Egypt. But also Egypt was to allow Israel uh, to, uh, uh, was to allow the Israelis ship to use the Suez Canal. Remember before that Egypt 
They did not allow the Israel ship to pass through the Suez Canal. Also, another thing which was agreed uh, was that Egypt should supply Israel with oil from the, an oil well at Southern Sinai, which has been just, uh, 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 you know, just opened. Another agreement was that Egypt and Israel should recognize each other. Remember, these countries had not recognized each other. That means the Egyptians did not recognize the existence of Israel, and Israel as well did not recognize the existence of Egypt. So one among things which has been agreed in that Camp Davis Accord was for Egypt and Israel to recognize each other. Another thing which was also part of the agreement on Camp Davis Accords was that Egypt should restrain from using force against Israel. That no matter what happened, Egypt should not use force against Israel. So if anything happened between these two countries, it must be solved through negotiations. It must be solved amicably. This is what has been uh, agreed. And so that became part of the agreement on Camp Davis Accord. My dear students, let's now look at the effect of the Camp Davis Accord. What is the effect of this Camp Davis Accord? The Camp Davis Accord had the following effect. One, Egypt was expelled from the Arab leagues by betraying the other Arab nations. Egypt was expelled from the Arab leagues for, be for betraying uh, other Arab nations. Remember, Egypt went to sign that treaty with Israel uh, you know, bilateral treat without including other nations. In fact, other nations did not recognize the treat that Egypt has signed. So Egypt was considered as the betrayer. But the second thing was that the peace agreement was considered as a victory to United States due to existing of East-West conflict. Remember I said earlier in 1956, even the war of 1967, Egypt was very close to USSR, but by Sadat signing treat with Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem and Begin, under the auspice of United States president, it means now Egypt is, come, is becoming very close to United States and it is moving very far from USSR. So to the Americans, it was a victory, especially looking back to that East-West conflict, looking back to the Cold War situation. So that is another very important effect. Another thing is that the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, was expelled from Egypt and Lebanon. They were in Egypt and Lebanon, but they were expelled. They were expelled because uh, of the, one of the conditions which was put by Israel that they should not host the Palestinian terrorists. Remember, the PLO to the Israelis were regarded as the terrorists. So Egypt agreed by expelling uh, the Palestinians who were in Egypt and also Lebanon also did the same because they realized that uh, the more the Palestinians live in their country, the more Lebanon is likely to be attacked by Egypt, but sorry, to be attacked by Israel. And because now Egypt has a treat with Israel, then Lebanon, I mean, so Lebanon feared that they don't have any other country to defend in case it is attacked by Israel. Another effect is the signing of peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, which fought four times since the creation of that state of Israel. Another effect of that accord was the signing of the treaty between Egypt and Israel. In fact, it was supposed to be the first. And remember, these two countries were two traditional enemies, which went to war four times. We mentioned 1940, 1948, 19, uh, you know, 1956, 1967, and 1973. Another effect of Camp Davis Accord, my dear students, is the assassination of President Anwar al-Sadat by Muslim Brotherhood, who claimed responsibility. Sadat was killed. Why? Because they blame Sadat that he has betrayed the Arab cause. He has betrayed, uh, uh, he has, uh, he has betrayed uh, his fellow Arab nations by signing the treaty with Israel. So Sadat was assassinated, uh, you know, was assassinated in Cairo. And this also is one of the effects of the Camp Davis Accord. Another thing, another effect is the establishment of USA-Egypt relations. USA-Egypt relations was established. In fact, it was strengthened. And Egypt is started to receive some military and financial aid from the United States of America ever since. Also, Egypt regained the occupied territories. Of course, I've said about this. They were able to get back the areas which were earlier conquered by Israel during the 1967 war and 1973 war. Another effect, my dear students, uh, is that 
It laid down a foundation for future peace agreement. It laid down a foundation for future peace agreement. We know that after that 1928, uh, Camp Davis Accord, there were some other agreements which had been made by the Arab leaders. There was peace agreement between Yasser Arafat and Menachem Begin, as we shall come to see about it later. Another thing, my dear students, is that, uh, as we can see, my dear students, this is the list of peace agreement which has been made uh, ever since. There is Camp Davis 1, 1928-1929. Jimmy Carter, remember, he brought together Sadat and Begin. But there was also Madrid Conference of 1991, where George W. Bush uh, brought together the Israelis and Arabs uh, together. Also, there is Oslo Accord of 1993. Billy Clinton, the President of the United States of America, brought together Yasser Arafat and Isha Karabin. Also, another, you know, another one was Camp Davis of 2000 Summit. This also, Billy Clinton again, brought together Arafat and Ehud Barak. So, my dear students, as you can see, uh, this is the peace, list of peace agreement. So, the effort has been made. But very recent, there was roadmap. George W. Bush introduced the roadmap, roadmap, of course, to peace in the Middle East. And also, uh, Barack Obama came up with what, the, with what he called a two-state solution, where the Jews and the Arabs, they can live together, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, whether two states can be established. A Jewish state and an Arab state can be established side by side. This is what was said by uh, Barack Obama. So as you can see, my dear students, there has been some efforts to solve uh, that problem, you know, uh, to, form that, to, to solve that conflict, which of course we said earlier in the last lesson that it was one of the long existing conflicts uh, in the world. But unfortunately, until now when we speak, there is no, uh, I mean, there is no, uh, there is no success to this effort. Uh, my dear students, let's very quickly look at the causes of the Middle East crisis. We have got the landy questions. Uh, the land questions, the issue of land. We have got the question of religion, Jewish expansionist policies. We've said about it. Impact of Cold War, strategic reasons, weakness of United Nations, role of imperialists, and so on and so forth. My dear students, let's not break for a while and we'll be back for the answering questions that I gave you earlier. Welcome back, my students. Remember, earlier in our, you know, when we started our lesson of today, I gave you some questions. And let's not look at the answers to the question that I gave you and I believe that also you have gone through this question and probably you have the answers as well so let's look at the first question the conflict between Arab and Jews has the far-reaching effect that goes beyond the disputed areas substantiate this statement that means the conflict between these two countries uh, between these two countries uh, between the Arabs we are talking of the uh, you know we are talking of the uh, Arabs and Jews, but our reference should be made in the Palestinians and the Jews, Palestinians and the Jews, Palestine and Israel. That conflict goes beyond, uh, you know, uh, I mean, they goes beyond the borders of these two countries. They are, you know, they have the far-reaching effect that goes beyond the disputed areas. Disputed area here, my dear students, we are referring to, uh, you know, we are referring to Palestine, the area which has the conflict. So it goes beyond. So let's look. What do we, I mean, how can you substantiate? How can we prove that, yes, that conflict has gone beyond? One is the political instability in the Middle East region. There is no peace in the Middle East region, my dear students. If you go to Iraq, you are going to find war. If you go to Lebanon, you are going to find war. If you go to uh, Syria, there is a war. And in fact, the conflict in, I mean, the wars which is fought in this area, they are very much linked with the problems which started between the Arabs and Jews, uh, you know, in those years, uh, in 1948. The second, you know, the second reasons that we can use to, to, substan uh, to substantiate this statement is the rise of terrorist movement. There is the rise of terrorist This is another impact, the rise of terrorist movement. If you go to Lebanon, you're going to find a group which is called Hezbollah. A group which is called Hezbollah. But also in Lebanon, there is also some Christian, uh, I mean the Christian militias. These Christian militias, they are supported by, they are supported by Israel. They are supported by Israel. So you can see, in places like Lebanon, there is also a lot, uh, there is always a lot of terrorist group. But also in, Pal uh, you know, uh, you know, but also those terrorist groups which operate in Palestine, sometimes they go beyond. You can look back, my dear students, to what was called the Black September. 
the Black September. You know, a terrorist group which was led by a man called George Habash. This has been one of the very few terrorist groups ever. So this is the second impact. The third impact is internationalization of the conflict. Internationalization of the conflict. The conflict has been internationalized. That means whatever happened in Israel, whatever happened in Palestine, then uh, it has to involve people of other nations. And of course we said in the previous lesson that it is because of religious importance of that place. For instance, we mentioned about Jerusalem, that in Jerusalem uh, there is a, it's a whole place for the Muslims, for the Christians, and for the Jews because of what I've already said. So that conflict has been internationalized. But in the previous time, it was internationalized because of the existence of Cold War. Another effect is the effect brought by refugees to neighboring states. The refugees, people who are running away from their countries, the Palestinian refugees, uh, they do not, uh, they were not only affected themselves because they have turned to be the refugees, but they also affect, uh, you know, I mean, they affect the people of the places where they are moving into. So the neighboring countries like Lebanon, for instance, like Syria, you know, uh, Jordan, Egypt, and other North African no, uh, and other North African countries have been affected by the large number of Palestinian refugees who are flowing to come to their countries. Another point here is militarization of the countries in the Middle East, led by Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. There has been militarization. The countries are establishing, uh, you know, they're expanding their military forces because of the tension. Because of the tension, there is one thing which has been can be referred has been referred, uh, you know, by some of the political scientists, which is called the balance of terror. That means in that region there is balance of terror. And so each country believes that the only way uh, a certain country in the Middle East can survive, it is for that country to have a lot of, uh, a lot of weapons and very large army. Today, as we speak, my dear students, Saudi Arabia, is a country which is leading for buying weapons from United States of America. And Israel is leading for receiving weapons from United States of America. So you can see, we have Iran, for instance. Today it is trying to develop nuclear weapons. We have Syria, we have Iraq, and so on. So militarization in the region has been increased because of the, uh, you know, because of that Arab-Jewish, uh, you know, because of that conflict between the Arabs and Jews. Another effect is psychological torture of the people who live in the surrounding areas. Some people who live in the surrounding areas, they have been tortured psychologically. For instance, Lebanon. Ever since, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, ever since the state of Israel was established in 1948, people who live in Lebanon, they have never knew peace because of the refugees who come to their country. But also sometimes Israel is attacking uh, Lebanon, either direct or indirect. So for that case, my dear students, you can see people who live in the nearby area, uh, nearby countries, they, they are tortured psychologically. But another thing is assassinations or attempt assassinations of leaders. Some leaders have been assassinated or there were some attempt assassinations. You can make reference to Ishaka, uh, you know, can make reference to Ishaq Rabin or Anwar Sadat who were assassinated by their own people because of that conflict. Sadat was assassinated, we said one of the reasons is because he signed the treat with the Jews during the Camp Davis Accord of 1978. But Rabin was assassinated because he signed the treat with Arafat in 1993 as you can see. So this also, has con uh, this also is one of the effects. Uh, my dear students, let's now come to the second question. And the second question says, uh, examine the obstacles of peace agreement in the Middle East between the Arab and Jews. What is the obstacles of, uh, you know, uh, the obstacles of peace agreement in the Middle East between Arab and Jews? The first is the land question. The first is the land question. There is this issue of land. If you talk to the Jews, they believe that that land belongs to them because it's the, you know, uh, uh, because it's a promised land. But the Palestinians also can claim uh, that that land belongs to them because it's the land of their ancestors. So there is this question of land. But most important also the issue of land, you can also speak of the status of Jerusalem, which of course is said, United Nations in 1947, when it was partitioned Palestine to form Israel, they declared Jerusalem to become an international city or a no man's land because of historical uh, because of its historical importance. So 
this is the first uh, this is the first obstacle, the issue of land, and also the role of Zionism. We said it earlier. A lot of people are, are coming to Israel from different parts of the world, and the more those people come, the more Israel want to establish new settlement for those people. So. As long as Zionism is continuing, uh, 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 as long as Zionism is going on, uh, then uh, it's very difficult for that area to have peace because Israel will always need the areas to establish the new settlement. Another point is internationalization of the conflict, that this conflict cannot be just ended by talking between the Arabs, the Palestinians, and Israel. It has to involve many nations because uh, it has a lot of stakeholders. There are so many actors in that conflict. So that also becomes one of the obstacles to peace agreement in the Middle East. Another thing is weakness of the United Nations. The United Nations has, uh, is very weak. First, for the way the United Nations has decided to establish that new state of Israel without consulting the people, because we have seen in other areas, for instance, uh, you know, for instance, in areas like uh, East Timor, which was under Indonesia, people voted to choose whether to uh, you know, uh, you know whether to remain in Indonesia or to establish their own state. But that kind of uh, that kind of referendum vote was not conducted in Palestine for people to decide. But also, United Nations uh, has always not been very active in dealing with some issues which are brought to the United Nations for discussion. Another thing is the law of United States. United States of America, one can say, she has got a carrot and stick. That means because she's a powerful country, many people believe that the United States is the one who uh, is the country which can finish that conflict. But because of her special relationship with Israel, then it becomes so difficult for that conflict to end. Another point, another uh, obstacle, my dear students, is the existence of many armed militias. In that region, there is a lot of armed militias. There is a lot of armed organizations to the extent that even if you speak with this organization, still other organizations can continue to fight. For instance, let's, let, uh, let's look, for instance, among the Palestinians. You want peace with the Palestinians. Who are you going to speak to? Are you going to speak with the Hamas? Or you're going to speak with PLO? Are you going to speak, let's say, with Al-Aqsa Brigade? Or you're going to speak with Al-Fatah? So that is very difficult because of the existence of a lot of armed militias. Another obstacle is the Jewish Arab ultra-nationalism. Jewish Arab ultra-nationalism. Ultranationalism, my dear students, is what we can speak of as the extreme nationalism. That because of this extreme nationalism, then some people believe that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some people believe that they cannot talk with the Jews. And the, some Jews believe they cannot talk with the Arabs. And that goes the same with the question of land. That some people believe that this is our ancestor land. This is our holy land. And we cannot allow anybody to take our land. And this explains why Rabin was killed. Rabin was assassinated because some Jews blamed Rabin that he's selling, uh, um, that Rabin is selling their lands to the Arabs and so on. Another point is religious question and the fate of Jerusalem. Of course, I've said about this of religious question and the fate of Jerusalem. Uh, my dear students, let me, now uh, let me now leave you with this question. What efforts, what efforts have been employed so far to solve the Middle East crisis? What effort has been employed so far to solve the Middle East crisis? Of course, I mentioned it earlier. There is Camp David I. Uh, there is Madrid Conference of 1991. There is Oslo Accord 1993. There is Camp David of 2000 Summit. Of course, Camp David II of 2000 Summit. There is Roadmap and a two-state solution, which of course is said was offered Barack Obama. So you can see, my dear students, uh, you go through this question and ask yourself, what efforts have been employed so far to solve the problem in the Middle East? Are those efforts functioning. My dear students, with this, my dear students, let's come the, to the end of our lesson of today and the end of our topic of threat to world peace. It is my hope, my dear students, that you have enjoyed this topic and you have been able to follow our, uh, to follow our lesson very well and so you can attempt any questions which comes from not only this subtopic but all, uh, but all other subtopics which we have discussed already in this topic. So with this note, my dear students, let me say goodbye and I wish you all the best.
Kipindi cha darasa online kimeletwa kwenu na chuo kikuu cha sauti Mbeya. Mtazamaji karibu katika kipindi kinachoangazia sekta ya mawasiliano hapa nchini. Leo tunaangazia siku ya usalama mtandaoni, siku ambayo huadhimishwa na nchi mbalimbali duniani kuanzia mwaka 2004 kwa lengo la kutoa elimu kwa umma juu ya namna ya kutumia mitandao kwa usalama. Mamlaka ya mawasiliano nchini TCRA imeadhimisha siku hii jijini Dar es Salaam kwa kukutanisha wanafunzi wa shule za msingi sekondari na vio lengo likiwa ni kutoa elimu na kuwakumbusha wananchi umuhimu wa kutumia mitandao kwa faida Irene Q Hill ni afisa tehama mkuu wa TCRA anaanza kueleza nini maana ya mtandao Mtandao ni muunganiko wa kompyuta au vifaa vingine vya mawasiliano na kumwezesha kuwawezesha wale watumiaji uweza kuwasiliana. Hiyo ndiyo maana halisi ya mtandao. Kwa ukiangalia hapo utagundua kwamba kwenye mtandao aa, kuna muunganiko. Eh, ni muunganiko wa kompyuta ambao aa, sana sana umefanywa aa, kwa ajili ya watu kuweza kuwasiliana. Kwa hiyo mtandao leo hii unatufanya tuone kama vile dunia ni kama kijiji kimoja kwa sababu haijalishi umbali ulioko unaweza kuwasiliana na mtu wakati wowote na uh, hivyo uh, tunaona kwamba mtandao inakuwa hauna mpaka lakini waswahili wanasema kwenye, me, kwenye wengi hawaribiki jambo katika ulimwengu wa mtandao mambo mengi yanatokea ukitumia mtandao vizuri utanufaika na faida zilizomo na ukitumia mtandao vibaya unaweza kupata na madhara mbalimbali. Kwa hiyo ni rai yangu kila mmoja kuwa makini pale anapokuwa anatumia mtandao. Nitoe mfano wa dogo zangu. Leo hii nani anaweza akatoka nyumbani saa sita za usiku akapita sehemu ambayo kabisa anaona hapa ni vichakani. Alafu anasema mimi napita kwa sababu tu kuna polisi, kuna mahakama, kuna wanasheria na pita. Kwa hiyo kila mtu anachukua tahadhari. Sasa jinsi tunavyochukua tahadhari kwenye huu ulimwengu wa kawaida na tunaweka milango, tunaweka na na magrili kwenye nyumba zetu, vivyo hivyo unapokuwa unatumia mtandao lazima kuzingatia kanuni, sheria na taratibu zilizowekwa. Na hasa kuzingatia sheria ya makosa ya mtandao ya mwaka 2015 na tano. Je kuna madhara gani kwa wananchi kutumia mitandao vibaya? Kiwi Hill anafafanua. Taarifa za uongo, eh? Fake news. Hii mashahidi. Nafikiri wengi wetu umepata ule ujumbe ambao unapenda pia kuongelea taasisi yangu ulienea juzi unasema mamlaka ya mawasiliano imeibiwa mitambo ya kuzima laini ambazo hazijasajiliwa. Mlipata au mlipata? Mlipata, eh? Sasa kama mnataka kudhibitisha tumeibiwa mitambo au la msisajili laini. Kwa hiyo ni mifano ambayo ya, ya fake news ambazo zinaendelea katika mitandao. Na njia sahihi ya kuepukana na kusambaza hizi fake news ni kuthibitisha. Unapopata taarifa yoyote ile katika mtandao, hakikisha kwanza unahakikisha eh cha unathibitisha chanzo cha hiyo taarifa. Kuliko wewe sasa ndio kuwa msambazaji kwa sababu mwisho wa siku kwa kupitia sheria ya makosa ya mtandao ya mwaka 2015 aliyeianzisha hiyo taarifa aliyeisambaza hiyo taarifa wote mtawajibika kwa mujibu wa sheria kwa hiyo tujiepushe sana kuvisambaza vitu taarifa ambazo hatuna uhakika nazo madhara mengine ambayo yapo kwenye mtandao ni uh, wizi wa utambulisho au identity uh, theft kwa hiyo unakuta mtu anaweza kutumia picha ya mtu na jina la mtu akafungua 